Well, hello, my friends. Thank you once again for joining me. Um, I want to have you turn in your Bibles, if you will. If you don't have a Bible, grab it quick. Um, and uh, I'd like to have you turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, the epistle of Paul to the uh, Corinthians. It's 1 Corinthians. I'm going to be in, uh, I'm going to start in chapter 4. Um, I'm going to be in a couple other places, I think, uh, but uh, I'm going to be kind of in chapter one quite a bit with this message, and uh, I hope it's a blessing to you. If you can open there, chapter four of 1 Corinthians to start with and have a marker uh, perhaps in chapter one to go there later. And uh, as you're getting that situated with your Bible, I'm going to start us in a word of prayer. Father, I just want to thank you. Um, Lord, as always, uh, you are a God of mercy and grace in our lives. I pray, Lord, that those watching, uh, that that can be a reality in their lives as well. Um, Lord, I uh, pray that you would uh, help us, teach us uh, how to seek you with all of our hearts, Lord, uh, to seek you first in your kingdom and your righteousness. And I and, uh, pray that you would uh, speak through me in a powerful way, in a way that, uh, that I'm not capable of, and, uh, Lord, that you would have your way in what is said and done in this video and in the hearts and lives of those watching. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 10. And uh, this is Paul uh, writing to the Corinthian church. And he says, we are fools, in verse 10, we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. And the title of my message for this video is, Whose Fool Are You? Whose Fool Are You? In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is addressing what uh, was likely seen by the world uh, as wisdom. The church at Corinth uh, was uh, perhaps seen by the world as, as wise. Uh, that church was marked by uh, wealth and power. But as Paul points out uh, throughout the letter, to the Corinthians. Uh, it was also a church full of pride, flesh, and some egregious sin, the sin that was within the church. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 4.10, Paul seems to, um, on the surface, be commending the Corinthians for being what he calls wise in Christ. Uh, he refers to them as strong, uh, honorable, in comparison to himself and the other apostles who he says are weak and despised. But what I see in this, when I look at the context with 1 Corinthians uh, as a whole, is perhaps a note of sarcasm from Paul, who he was among a group of men who traveled the known world uh, at great cost and sacrifice in order to bring the gospel to the lost. It is likely that the Corinthian church saw Paul much the way uh, society at the time saw Paul, uh, as uh, foolish. Uh, there are indeed many perspectives in the world as to what, what foolishness looks like. When I look at the concept of foolishness in Scripture, I see three types of fools in the world. The fool for self, the fool for religion, and the fool for Christ. Um, the question is, whose fool are you? Whose fool are you? Um, first of all, let's look at the fool for self. Uh, he's his own God. Um, he, he's going to identify himself perhaps as an atheist or an agnostic. Psalm 14, 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The fool for self is a rebel against authority. Uh, he trusts only his own heart. His moral code is established by his own mind, emotions, and will, uh, often on the fly. Uh, and often changes with his feelings and his circumstances. He rejects the Bible truth that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's Jeremiah 17, 9. Proverbs 28, 26. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. One thing about the fool for self that could be seen as commendable, perhaps from a human standpoint, is that he's perhaps more honest about it, perhaps. Uh, there's usually very little in the way of pretenses, uh, usually makes no excuse, uh, and is often very proud of the fact that he has no God besides himself. Um, this is not the case with the second 
group, the fool for religion, the fool for religion. Romans 1 tells us all about them, all about those who are the fool for religion. In verse 21 of Romans 1, it says, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorrupt or uncorruptible God into an image made like an, unto, uh, like to corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. You see, the religious man has taken Almighty God or um, some previously established man-made version of God and made him human. Essentially, he's still a self-worshipper, but has deceived himself. His God usually has a name and represents an established creed, but whatever the uh, image the religious one is worshiping, it's really a spiritual icon infused with self. Sometimes this image may even look at first glance like the God of the Bible, until one who understands the Bible starts asking questions. No matter what the name or face is put on the religion, it's all the same. Apart from the real God who has revealed himself plainly in Scripture, he will, uh, we will all create God in our own image. When we get religious, we get deceived by our own hearts. That we can trust whatever it is that has our faith. We are like the Israelites of Romans 10. Romans 10 verse 3 says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Whether you're a fool for self or a fool for religion, it's important to understand that you're not alone. Uh, it's our nature to worship. We were created that way. And hence, it is our nature to latch on to whatever seems to fit that role in our lives and consider it wise. The world, the devil, or our own flesh will lie to us. The Bible calls it a strong delusion, but you'll be amazed at how liberated and free you feel when you realize that you've been deceived. As a fool for self or a fool for religion, You'd be, you'd be just incredibly amazed at how, how uh, deceived you've been, but yet how free you feel when you finally become a fool for Christ. A fool for Christ, number three, fool for Christ. Uh, he is the one who is surrendered to Christ as Lord of his life. Uh, he's heard the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and come to the cross in repentance and faith. Now we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you can flip over there, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to hit verse 17. For Christ sent me not to be to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. See, to the world and society, the fool for Christ looks like a fool because the rest of the world is drowning in its own wisdom. The wisdom of the world is a mentality of, of mob rule. They call it culture. They call it tradition. They call it science. It's common wisdom. This is not to say that everything that is called culture is bad uh, or that everything that is considered tradition or, or science is necessarily wrong. But it's easier to swallow something that is a deviation from truth if the majority believes it. Have you ever wondered how a peaceful protest can so quickly turn into a riot and escalate into looting and destruction? How quickly the minority in a crowd can suddenly feel justified in doing terrible things because those around them have such passion and such convincing arguments. Back in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching 
to save them that believe. In verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. If you flip over to chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool, that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men. Do you glory in men? Are you bound by the wisdom of the world? I know it's hard to see, but it's a path to destruction. The foolishness of Christ is a wisdom that is real and eternal. Give up the mob rule mentality and come to Christ. Don't take my word for it. Look at the Bible. It's a document like no other. It stood the test of time. If you have questions or need help, reach out to me, johnclawton.org. You can email me at john at johnclawton.org. But please, if you need help, contact me. Uh, this, this thing, the foolishness of Christ, uh, it does seem foolish to the world. It does seem foolish to our society out there. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not advocating any, any kind of um, you know, extreme conspiracy theorism or any of those things. But what I am advocating is that you look into the scriptures and you truly, truly examine yourself according to the scriptures and see that God is real, that he's really there, that he loves you, that he wants to save you. And yes, he wants you to have a home in heaven when you die. But more importantly, he wants you to have a relationship with him here on earth, in this world, in this time. And because the relationship with God uh, here in our time, in our world, uh, the way things are right now, is, is, is the only thing that is truly eternal. Eternal. Because when our life in this world is over, when our, when our, our, our time on this earth is done, all that's left is eternity. And that's when your relationship with God is really going to matter. Not that it doesn't matter now. We need to have a strong relationship with God. That's why I'm talking to you now. God uh, wants you. Uh, he loves you. And you need him more than you know, perhaps. Call on him today. Reach out to me if you have questions or if I can help you. John at johncelawton.org. Thanks for watching.